Gal got the nod for Best Actor as Connell, while director Lenny Abrahamson won a nomination for Outstanding Directing for a limited series. Meanwhile, the original novel's author Sally Rooney and co-writer Alice Birch both received a nod for their work on episode three, while casting director Louise Keeley also received a nomination. And that's your news update. It's just gone two minutes past seven. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For great value van insurance, go online to the AA.ie. Tonight will be mainly dry with clear spells and a few light showers in northern areas. Cloud will thicken in the southwest overnight with rain arriving by morning. Lowest temperatures between 7 and 10 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Round on Off the Ball with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. This is News Talk. Yeah, busy show for you this evening. Eric Donovan is going to be with us this hour, just over two weeks away now from the biggest fight of his professional career. He's been looking for this kind of opportunity, Eric, and he's been given it at long last. So at 35, he's got a huge fight in literally Eddie Hearn's back garden. There's a month of boxing coming up on Sky Sports in Eddie Hearn's back garden and Eric is going to feature in week three in about two weeks time so Eric on the way at half past seven eight o'clock David Brady with us he's had an amazing lockdown uh, frankly full of phone calls with strangers I'm sure you've seen that he's been doing this uh, he reached out said anyone who needs a chat anyone who's lonely let me know and I'll phone you and he did just that and we're talking hundreds of phone calls across lockdown so we'll talk to David Brady about that after eight o'clock and then Dara O'Shea not the Kerry footballer he is very much the dub. West Brom's Young Player of the Year broke through in December and he's had a breakout 2020 and he's headed for the Premier League. He's going to join us in the football show. 53106 is the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. Bit of Kenny Cunningham coming your way as well on the football show. We have with us Richie McCormack. Hello. And Ronan. Hello, Kenny Cunningham and Dee Brady in the one show. You have your trotters up for this. Oh, Skype is not behaving. Richie, we'll try that again. Hello. How are you? Bit of a delay, Richie. We're operating with a serious delay. We're talking satellite news cable <laughs> in the 1980s territory here, so we're going to have to watch our P's and Q's. Zero interruptions, be warned. I'll just shut up. <laughs> and Ronan Mullen, <laughs> how is your Skype? Hello. I hope you can hear me, Joe. I'm here. I can hear you. Slightly less egregious delay than Richie McCormick. Who are here? Good. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Richie, I'm, this, this could be tricky. This could be tricky. <laughs> He's giving me the thumbs up. Do we want to just say over when we finished? Over. <laughs> <laughs> Probably be <the> obvious. <laughs> so, uh, Ronan, we should mention Eric Donovan coming up half past seven. This is the fight he's been looking for. He's just turned 35. March 2019, he won the Irish title and you suspect he was a man in a hurry, not least because of age. And it's been a frustrating time for him since then. This is a real opportunity now. Big audience, I think, on a very decent undercard. Uh, big, you know, uh, I think it's right behind uh, Felix Cash, Jason Welburn. So he's got a good slot. He's changed promoters recently. This is kind of a make or break moment in his, in his professional career. Yeah, it absolutely is. And you mentioned that Irish world or Irish title win in 2019 and that seemed like that was going to be the to spark something not only for him but for Irish boxing and from a professional level anyway on live television and drew a big audience that night but for whatever reason things just never came together through no fault of his own he put on a brilliant display that night and as you mentioned as get like he's he's always wanted someone to take a chance and maybe because he's not really in a position to be able to force the narrative himself um, he needs a, a, to be the opponent almost, and that is the case in this fight. He'll admit that he's gone over there as the B-side matchroom. Is Alpha Barrett is the opponent. He's a new matchroom signing. They're looking at him as the next big thing in Manchester to follow on from maybe not the heady heights of Ricky Hatton, but maybe on the Anthony Crawler, Scott Quigg level, that this guy could maybe be a ticket seller in the north of England. And they're bringing over Eric Donovan as a, as a reputable opponent, but someone they think Barrett should be beating. And this is the golden opportunity for Eric on a stage, massive stage, when boxing is going to be back in the limelight. And to be fair to Eddie Aaron, it's, it looks like a, a pretty good production that if Eric can deliver on the promise that you know has been there throughout his amateur and professional career, it could really launch him in this late part of his career into the big time. Yeah, and as you say, 
this fight from the Hearn perspective is all about Zelfa, or Zelfa Barrett, who's 26, 27 mm -hmm. years of age, because even Hearn said, I really like Zelfa. I think he has the ability to be the new star in the city of Manchester. So as you say, Ronan, that's mm -hmm. what they're hoping to do is create somebody for the city of Manchester to get behind. And this is a decent fight for him, but they expect him to win. They expect him to dispatch of Donovan and then to, you know, ascend to that status in Manchester. And for Eric, it's the chance to go over, spoil the party and force himself into more conversations. Yeah, and if I was Zelfa Barrett and Zelfa Barrett's team, I'd be like, what are you doing to me? Giving me Eric Donovan, this, uh, all due respect to Eric, and we think he's brilliant, but in England he wouldn't be a known fighter, but he's an absolute nightmare mm. of an opponent, like so talented. And uh, as you said, people are going to be expecting Barrett to win. This is a showcase fight for him. And yet if Eric Donovan goes over and does what we know he can do and, and wins this fight by a landslide, the British public are going to be looking at each other thinking, I thought Barrett was the next big thing. So. Yeah. Um, I, if I was their team, I'd be a bit perturbed by the matchmaking, but it's just a golden opportunity for Eric. And Mark Dunlop uh, has done a great job of getting Irish fighters onto these shows. Even James Tennyson this weekend, who's fought for world titles in the past and is one of the most exciting fighters on the Irish-British boxing scene. You know, he's getting a, a really big platform this weekend too. Obviously, Katie Taylor is uh, co-headlining the final round of fights uh, in Eddie Heron's backyard and against Delphine Pursun, which we, we can't wait for that one either. But it, it, things bode well for uh, Irish professional boxing in the sense that we're getting probably uh, more limelight on the professional side of things than we had been in, in recent times. Tony Bellew echoed your point. He was warning Eddie Hearn about Eric Donovan's talent and was saying what a brilliant amateur he was, what a good fighter is, how this is a really tough ask for Barrett in some ways because Donovan to a UK audience is low profile, but he's incredibly dangerous. Like if Barrett goes out and beats him comfortably, he won't get any credit, you know, in the way he might with a bigger name. So this is just treacherous and not a huge amount of payoff. And Bellew was making that point as well. So looking forward to chatting to Eric about that. Richie McCormick, I'm told we have dialed you back. How is that delay over? Uh, it seems a little bit better, but you know, who's to know these things? <laughs> it's a bit better, it's a bit better, it's a bit better. Uh, before we get into the news round, Jurgen Klopp announced his PFA Manager of the Year last night. It was announced on Sky Sports. There was a very special message from a certain somebody. And all anybody wants to know is about this 3 a.m. phone call. Have a listen. And of course, the winner, Jurgen Klopp. Jurgen, fantastic. I speak about we United 16 years in the Championship. Liverpool, 30 years since winning that week. Uh, incredible and I really thoroughly deserved the performance level of your team was outstanding your personality went right through the whole club I think it was a marvellous marvellous performance I'll forgive you for waking me up at half past three in the morning to tell me you'd won the week thank you but anyway you thoroughly deserved it well done just when Jurgen Klopp couldn't go up any higher in the eyes of Liverpool fans he's waking Alex Ferguson up at half past three in the morning to scream then the phone to him, Ronan. This is just, I mean, this is a saintly status now. Yeah, but I, I did appreciate that Ferguson, even amidst Liverpool's uh, greatest moment, did manage to reinforce one more time the 30-year wait that it's been almost <laughs> that that augments Klopp's achievement that, oh my God, you've finally done it after 30 years. You've man you are the man, Jürgen. You've done it. You've brought it back. So uh, I think through gritted teeth, he managed to give him the plaudits. But it's hard to argue. I think Ferguson Fer Ferguson can be quite a magnanimous loser, I think, at times. I thought that was fulsome in its praise of how good Liverpool have been. In no, fairness. No, 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 no. He managed, he, he he got the praise in, but he also managed to point out that the 30-year wait uh, was one that was quenched uh, in the last couple of weeks. A 30-year wait that was fueled mainly by him, uh, let's be quite honest. And he also got a dig in at Leeds as well. So Fergie knew well what he was doing <laughs> with that uh, little speech, as magnanimous as you want to pay him here. Uh, but as, like, as well as that, that did, what clearly happened here is, is somebody got hold of Klopp's phone because remember, they're all holed up in the one hotel. They've all been, you know, in a bubble uh, ahead of matches and all that kind of stuff. So they're all in one place, the Liverpool squad and management uh, that night that, uh, that Chelsea essentially handed them the title. Somebody's gotten hold of Klopp's phone. Scroll through the contacts and Ryan gone. Do you know? Do you know what we'll do? We'll, uh, we'll call Ferguson <laughs> and see if he answers. And they've basically done a prank call there because I don't think the Klopp is. I did, do you remember in like the Damned United in the book, the David Peace book, where Clough would randomly ring up Revy at random points to just go, "Oh, what am I doing wrong? They don't love me the way they love you." Yada yada yada. I don't think Klopp is that insecure. 
as the Clough portrayed in David Peace's book. But this is definitely a crank call. Had to be, 100%. Yeah. Okay, you're 100% right. That is definitely what's happened. We'll find out which of the players did it in due course, <laughs> I would think now. That is totally it. And God, I'd love to have been there at the moment when someone said, Ferguson, he's got Ferguson's number. Go on, will we? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the sheer boldness. So uh, that's what's going on in the world. Eric Donovan, half seven. David Brady, eight o'clock. And Dara O'Shea of West Brom coming your way at nine. Let's start the news round with thanks to Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it, made of what matters. Richie, where are we starting? Uh, we'll start with Derry City. They've confirmed that fans won't be allowed to attend Friday's league resumption at home to Sligo Rovers. On the same night, a crowd of 500 will be in attendance at the Irish Cup final meeting of Glen Torren and Ballymena United at Windsor Park. Ulster GEA, as we know, are allowing crowds of up to 400 at club matches per the guidance of the Northern Ireland executive. But Derry have decided that their game with Sligo will go ahead behind closed doors at the Brandywell. The Northern Ireland executive guidelines are at odds with those in the Republic with crowds limited here to 200 but speaking on this morning's OTBAM Luke O'Neill professor at the School of Biochemistry and Immunology at Trinity College says the caution is advised we're doing a great job with the country we're all in behind this aren't we you know and we're getting very close to elimination remember which is fantastic news altogether anywhere you're you're, you're risking spread a big crowd gathering crowds mixing you know, especially indoors, as I say, not observing the guidelines basically increases the threat of the thing coming back, you see. So that's the big worry we have. Um, the the, uh, the 200 to 500 thing is still kind of being obsessed about in, in sporting terms at the moment. Um, and Owen made the point a little bit earlier on. So we're watching Premier League games and we're watching stuff from most of the rest of the world, with the exception really of, of New Zealand, where they have done an amazing job. We're going to be one of the first places where you actually do have um, people at stadiums. Again, it, would you have any concerns about us going from 200 to 500 outdoors in three weeks time or actually do you think now is not the time for that wait until the schools are back and then see what happens well again it's about the numbers if, if the numbers are good you can begin to think about those sorts of crowds again you know so i think it's a, it's a week by week basis but i'll tell you one thing if, if we begin to see a spike in two or three places around the country you can forget it you know because then it's too much of a risk then that'll start to spread again you know yeah, it's such an ever-changing situation, isn't it? That's Luke O'Neill, who was on OTBM mm -hmm. this morning. You can catch the full chat in the usual places, not least the new app, which is waiting for you in your app store. Just search OTB Sports. We'll play some more of what Luke O'Neill was saying this morning in the second hour of the show tonight after David Brady. Rich, Cass have released, what, a 92-page document detailing the Man City decision. Anything of note? Uh, that's pretty much what slowed down my Wi-Fi this evening at the Court of Arbitration for Sports saying that Manchester City showed a blatant disregard to cooperating with UEFA's investigation into potential breaches of financial fair play. City, as we know, had a two-season European ban overturned by CAS a fortnight ago. A €30 million Euro fine was also cut to €10 million. CAS released their full findings this afternoon in that 92-page document. Uh, among the nice little nuggets in it, apparently nine different Premier League clubs wrote to CAS asking them to uh, keep hold of that European ban for Manchester City. Uh, but essentially, the 92-page document just fleshes out what we knew already, is that Manchester City weren't exactly cooperative in the investigation and that UEFA's uh, attempts to uh, to charge them with these things were a little bit overstated and that certain issues were time-barred and that uh, there were serious breaches of what they call compliance, but not necessarily of exactly financial fair play. Right, OK. Meanwhile, Bournemouth are flirting with the idea of trying to take on the Premier League. I just, I, I, I fully suspect the Premier League have watertight protection on this type of issue, but Bournemouth may have a crack at it anyway. Yeah. It's Hawkeye rather than the Premier League, I think they're looking to take issue with this. They're considering legal action over the failure to award a key goal against Aston Villa. The Cherries were relegated on the final day of the Premier League season. They finished just a point behind Villa, who themselves stayed up. In their first game back after the restart, as we know, Villa drew with Sheffield United, who had a an obvious good goal ruled out. Goal line technology provider Hawkeye apologised for a systems failure, but it's understood the board of Bournemouth met this week to discuss the possibility of legal action. Mm. It would be a hell of a precedent to set if they could sue Hawkeye successfully. I mean, what would jump out at me as well, Ronan, is that in the game itself, where Hawkeye absolutely failed, the referee and the linesman were still on the pitch and they, they could have overruled the situation. I just don't see them getting anywhere with this case at all. No, but I do suppose the fact that Hawkeye came out and admitted fault, that, you know, they've almost held their hands up and admitted that they're, you know, in the wrong here, and that almost gives Bournemouth a platform to build a case from, but it, you just you just imagine there is going to be an out here that the clubs have signed some small print that uh, 
allows for a human error on even on the technological side of things. So you're right, though. The referees, and I was kind of of the opinion at the start of the season, because the pitch side monitor stuff has come back to the fore, and I think from next season, the referees are going to be encouraged to use them. But I did actually see the logic in allowing um, like the decision to lie elsewhere so that basically the referees aren't being harried all game long over decisions they make, that he can basically uh, quash all those disputes by saying, well, it wasn't my decision. But actually, the opposite is true. It's turned out that... Uh, They've been disempowered, the referees, really. And even in that instance where Michael Oliver's staring um, agog, basically, at the whole situation, almost it's as if he knew that his eyes weren't deceiving him, that that ball was over the line, but his watch hadn't signaled uh, that to be true. So I think from next season on, the referees are just going to have to have a bit more onus on themselves and remember that the officials on the pitch have a job to do as well as, as, well as the technology. Yeah. I mean, it is crazy that even Oliver knew something was awry and couldn't do anything about it. And he was even pointing to his watch as if to say it hasn't beeped, it hasn't mm. buzzed. So even though, yeah, that looked a bit dodgy to me as well, I can't do anything about it. They've got the balance totally wrong with the referees. I mean, this should be a backup and an assistance to the referees. They should be over on the sideline for any situation they want to have a look at again. And it would eliminate so many issues. They're really, like, for what seems like a simple balance to find, I think they have made a bit of a mess of VAR and... I'm not quite sure why they were so anti-referees coming over to have a look at the camera on the touchline. I think they felt it would slow the game up too much. But in reality, they just created situations where the players didn't know what was going on, fans didn't know, the referee was just stood there. At least when they were going over to the camera on the touchline, I, I'm, I don't want to say it was great theatre, but there was something for everybody to watch and people knew what was going on. Yeah, and that was particularly exacerbated at the start of the season where there were junior match officials who hadn't really uh, officiated in Premier League games before who were given the responsibility of overruling the on-pitch official. And like you can understand why people would be reluctant to do that when they see far more experienced officials making an on-field decision and then junior people are looking at it in a different location and thinking, well, I'm not really in a position to question the great Michael Oliver over his decision on the pitch. But they've obviously switched that towards the end of the season where they have actually got proper senior referees in the in the booth but yeah I think as I said I think the officials on the pitch are going to have to uh, resume the onus basically that they are in charge and not just facilitating VAR and like I think the offside thing people will agree the minutia and the drawing of lines is it's just absurd like I think it the rule of thumb needs to be that if you can if you can't judge it off the still images and allow for a margin of error because not to get into discussions about frame rates, Joe, but the frame rates of, of television cameras aren't exceptional in football yet, as compared to cricket, where it's probably a factor of 10 better, where they can really slow down and judge exactly where the ball clips. Whereas I think there was the, the goal that was disallowed against Manchester United, which also tr proved to be determining could have uh, ruled Leicester out of Champions League contention. Like, Wilfred Zaha's foot was, foot was blurred because they couldn't quite... Yeah get the exact moment when he struck the ball. So you can't, they can't be so sure, so they can't be overruling goals. I just think uh, that's a non-starter and it, it should never have been the case, I don't think. It's not why it was brought in. It was brought in to get rid of clear errors and these are far from clear errors. Yeah, the moment of contact with the football has proven more problematic than they anticipated and how long contact lasts for and the freeze framing, it gets very, very messy. Anytime someone produces a 92-page document on your behaviour, you know you haven't been a good boy, says no. Well, that is true. Bournemouth are going to sue lovable Hawkeye as played by Alan, Al Alan Alda in MASH. It seems a bit random, lads, says John. <laughs> I've never watched MASH, Richie. No. It, it, it's very much of its time. It's, it's nice and it's quaint. I know Sky One used to uh, show repeats of it a lot in the early 90s at around 6pm of a weekday. Um, can't say it ever grabbed me at the time. No. I don't think I'm likely to go back, but uh, it, it had its place. Hugely popular. If you ever see the figures for the series finale of that in the US, they were absolutely immense. It was a massive, massive TV event at the time, um, but uh, not for me. I think it predates me just a little bit. Okay. Where are we going next? Uh, to Galway, uh, Salt and Stahl won the feature race on day two of the Galway races. The Colum Quinn BMW Mile Handicap, the 11 to 1, should be Njord into second with only human, uh, one for human league fans there at 18 to 1. Uh, trainer John Gosden, meanwhile, says he'll take a crack at the pre at the with 
Stradivarius, the sixty or the six year old, pardon me, came to fourth consecutive Goodwood Cup this afternoon, a glorious Goodwood. Entry in the arc will pose an issue for jockey Frankie Dettori, who's set to be aboard Enable at Longchamp. And speaking with Racing TV this evening, Dettori says it will leave him in a strange position. I'm talking to, I don't know if you've spoken to Bjorn Nilsson, but he's, he's toying with the idea of having a crack at the arc. Mm. I know. I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to try to put him off, but you know, <laughs> if he wants to, why not? You know, obviously, I, 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 I I'm on enable at the moment, but <laughs> who knows? It, uh, I'm not going to discourage him. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's done nothing wrong. Uh, it's a possibility that the ground will come very soft. The way he doesn't mind, uh, and uh, yeah, so be it. Maybe. Could he end up being your biggest threat on enable? Possibly. <laughs> Don't ask me too many bad questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking myself for all here. <laughs> 100% of our profits go back into racing. Okay. Real Madrid, meanwhile, Rich, they've had a positive COVID. They have indeed. Mariano, their striker, has tested positive for coronavirus. The La Liga champions say that he is in perfect health and will be isolating at home for 14 days. Mariano, though, has just made seven appearances for the Spanish Giants this season, meaning uh, he was unlikely to be involved in the second leg of their Champions League. Last 16 tie away to Manchester City on Friday week. Wezo, welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, we'll all have a rise in League Two football this coming season. For former Republic of Ireland playmaker Wes Houlihan is back in English football. He signed a one-year deal with League Two side Cambridge United. Houlihan had spent just under a year with Australian A-League side Newcastle Jets, having been on trial at Cambridge this time last year. Obviously, being here last year and seeing the facilities and training ground and uh, the lads and um, you know how it works, I um, enjoyed it. And uh, I just thought, you know, from where I am in Norwich, it's it's, it's great to get to and stuff like that. And uh, you know, such a, a fantastic club that I'm, uh, I'm delighted to sign. And Rich Villa didn't spend their money so wisely last season. They've made a change. Mm. They have just a couple of days after securing their Premier League future, Aston Villa sacking their sporting director, Jesus Garcia Pitark. Villa spent over £140 million last summer with Pitark at the forefront of player identification and appointment. Yeah, I'm not shocked to see that news, to be honest. They're going to have to do a lot better this off season, especially if they lose Grealish. Meanwhile, the World Championship snooker qualifiers continue. Yeah, uh, one of the last Irishmen standing, Jordan Brown, will take a 5-4 lead. In fact, he has taken a 5-4 lead into the evening session of his qualifier with Ryan Day. Day is a uh, three-time quarter finalist at the Crucible, but Brown now leads by six frames to four. He had led or had trailed by me, Brown, by three frames to one at some, one stage this afternoon. The first to ten will progress to the Crucible with the Ulsterman looking to make his debut at the fabled Sheffield venue. OK, fellas, thanks a million for that. Richie, cheers. Ronan Mullen, thanks as ever. Cheers, lads. We have David Brady after 8 o'clock. We'll be talking to Dara O'Shea of West Brom after 9. And up next, Eric Donovan, two weeks out from the biggest fight of his professional career. The News Round on Off the Ball. With Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette.